Hello, gamers. It's me, fellow gamer Antonio D'Amico. This is Pointy Hat, and it's time to grab your gaming fuel and your gamer tag and your gamer games because we are gaming. I'm transitioning into video game content, so I'm trying to ease you into it. How am I doing? No, 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 no. Wait, wait, wait. I'm joking. Don't leave. This is still very much a DD channel. I'll drop it. Let me restart. I'm Antonio D'Amico. This is Pointy Hat. Yada, yada, yada. Tip of the hat. So as I said before, I've been playing Baldur's Gate 3, the D&D video game, a uh, very normal amount. Get out. Get out! Very normal, very cool, not at all concerning. I've just been spending time with my new friends. Leslie. Sad little earth monkey. Shadow the Hedgehog. I'm a gatekeeper and a hater. Carglass. Carglass repara. Gay L. <laughs> that is not correct. Singer songwriter Halsey. I speak for the trees. Preminger from the director video feature Barbie as a Princess and the Pauper. <laughs> and whatever. And I think I have made some pretty interesting discoveries while playing this little video game that have inspired me to make changes at my D&D table. That's what this video is about. I want to see what D&D players and DMs can learn from Baldur's Gate 3. The makers of Baldur's Gate 3 changed plenty of stuff about D&D when adapting it to video game form, so what can we learn from their changes when we play the actual thing? Oh, and don't worry, you don't need to have played a single second of this video game to get what's going on here. That's why I played it. To, to help you. Not to procrastinate, no, 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 definitely not. Stop asking questions, let's go. So for those of you who don't know, somehow, Baldur's Gate 3 came out recently and has been inundating my and most likely your feed with a, a lot of people having an extremely normal Christian time with it. Gods, I wanna ride you till you see stars. Ah! This little video game is not just an officially licensed D&D product, meaning it doesn't just have D&D official lore in it, but Baldur's Gate 3 just Words like D&D. Baldur's Gate 3 has skill checks, just like D&D. It has initiative, just like D&D. It has classes, just like D&D. And it has a bunch of people going on fantasy adventures instead of going to therapy, just like D&D. But of course, this is a video game and video games are not D&D, right? Fourth edition. So there are differences between the two and the ways that Baldur's Gate 3 interacts with the systems of fifth edition is what I'm interested in discussing today, as well as what we can learn from those for our D&D games. Normally in my videos, I go over D&D concepts I explain them, and then I create a new thing that you can use in your D&D games. I create new creatures, new races, new subclasses, new lore, just a whole bunch of world building. But in this video, I won't be doing any of that. Because I'm gonna be doing that live, and you can watch me! That's right, there's no sponsor this week. I took my own sponsorship section for myself because I really, really want you to hear me out, so please stay. I'm streaming, and it's not an actual play. <laughs> no, I'm gonna be doing world building live on Twitch. Through my lives, we'll be creating a whole new world from scratch, coming up with its magic system, its lore, its deities, its general rules, and then we'll be going deeper, making cultures, countries, and then cities and then organizations, and then people, and the audience gets a say on what we end up making. I'll be using polls for stuff I want to leave up to viewers, so we'll be creating this world together on stream. And if that doesn't sound like your cup of soup, or you would like to see me suffer, which, why? You can come next Wednesday, where I'll be live streaming a Dark Urge playthrough of Baldur's Gate 3, where the audience is the Dark Urge. Dark Urge is a specific mode of Baldur's Gate 3 that not many pick as their first run. I didn't for sure, so I am fresh to it, and I thought it would be fantastic to stream with all of you. So I'll be world building live on Sundays and playing Baldur's Gate on Wednesdays. It'll be at 5pm EST, 2pm PDT, and 10pm GMT plus 1 for Europeans. At least for now. I've been doing some marketing research. I said get out! And it appears that humans react favorably to a human face. So I'll be streaming through my human familiar. Say hi. Hi! So yeah, my first live stream starts this Sunday, two days after posting this video. Link to the Twitch channel is of course in the description. Mwah. Okay, now that we've gotten that out of the way, bold gate. Bald. Don't worry, I'm only showing clips from Act 1 on screen, and most of them are from within the first three hours of gameplay. All of them without context, maybe some trailer stuff, no spoilers. You're safe for now. I've divided my points into an internet-friendly numbered list because it scratches my smooth little brain. I want these to be useful to both DMs and players, and I've further divided them into two sections, narrative and mechanics. So let's start with narrative. 1. Make characters with a common goal. All of the main companions in Baldur's Gate 3 that joined your party were taken by the evil space squids, mind players, and infected with their tadpole parasites, and are trying to get these evicted from their skull before they get turned into squidlings themselves. You're a kid. 
Nearly all, there's one that could be considered a main companion that is free from tadpolification. But the reason he's a companion is because all of the fans' thirst collectively combine strong armed Larian into making him playable. Good for him. Bears aside, all of them share a common goal. Get the tadpole out before they turn into squids from hell. I am flabbergasted by how often people don't do this when starting D&D campaigns, because I have never, ever run a long-term campaign without doing exactly this. And by this, I don't mean squidification. I mean giving all player characters a common goal from the very start of the campaign. I know that the classic D&D campaign starts with you meet in a tavern, but in my experience, that ends up playing out exactly like this. You either trickle in one by one and describe your character, or your DM just spawns all of you in the tavern, in which case you will sit there quietly wondering what does everyone even look like, at which point someone will instantly locate the darkest corner of the place and sit there with his hood up, and you instantly know that that's the guy that's fun at parties. Then you all shift awkwardly at your own tables without anyone making a move, because 97% of the D&D player base is introverted to hell and back, and nobody actually wants to make the first step until your DM finally decides to throw at you an underwhelming combat encounter, and then you shift awkwardly some more until one of you pipes up with an extremely wooden and forced, we should stick together and figure out what's going on. Like you're in the fantasy Scooby gang and you all agree, even though it's extremely out of character for your character to actually do so because you gotta end up together somehow. And, and uh, is that like good? Do you really enjoy that? Or are you just doing that because it's tradition? What is that opening truly accomplishing? Is it the randomness of it that people like? I get that it's cool that you were all joined by fate, you're just some randos, not some predestined heroes or chosen ones, but you can still do that and give yourself a common goal. The party in Baldur's Gate 3 were not predestined to meet, they weren't chosen heroes or whatever, they just got extremely unlucky to find themselves in the way of the very hungry cat or tadpole. Having a common goal for everyone in the party is a stepping stool to a much smoother start to a campaign, to a story. There is a reason for your characters to want to stick together. You don't have to sit there playing 40 chess against yourself as to why you're definitely not Batman character that half the internet told you not to make, but you did it anyway because you think you're so much smarter than everybody else would even stay with these people. The reason is you share a goal. You want to stay with them. Simple as that. Common goals can be literally anything. You enter a competition and are grouped in random teams. Each of you has their own reasons for doing so, but all of you entered willingly and want to win. And since you compete in groups, you have to do your best as a team if you want to accomplish your goals. See, that common goal doesn't even require you to tell the other party members your reason why you would want to win this competition. You get to keep that a secret until the campaign fizzles out and you never get to share that you were in fact the anime protagonist all along. Or how about even a simpler one? You are all going to the same place. It's far away and the road is treacherous. So instead of hiring an expensive mercenary team to escort you there, you decide that traveling together is the best option. That one is even simpler and gives you enough time for your characters to actually grow close before you are in need of a better reason to travel together. Another great benefit is that common goals generally tie directly with the story. You know, if your DM does it that way, and why wouldn't they? And so it means that you are actively engaging with the story of the campaign from the very beginning of the game, instead of waffling about doing like random fetch quest until you suddenly stumble with the plot. I personally really dislike the stumbling in the dark approach to D&D campaign beginning, where the plot kind of finds you like five to ten sessions in, oh god. I'm just not an episodic sort of person, I can't get invested in such short-term stakes, so getting right into the main plot from session one is much more desirable to me both as a DM as a player. So if you have never tried this, ask your DM if they'll be interested in doing this the next time. Or better yet, be a DM and do it yourself. DIY DMing. 2. Reuse, Reduce, Recycle NPCs So if you're anything like me, you love coming up with NPCs. As a dungeon master, this is as close as we get to character creation. It's just fun to come up with you blorbos that you can inflict on your players and induce as much psychic damage as possible. So this one is an evil dark reincarnation of a dead god of war and destruction, but she exquisitely speaks in an uwu voice widowy all the time. And this one is an extremely plot relevant NPC that has an insufferable French accent all the time. And this one only talks in Shadow the Hedgehog one-liners, and this is his sister, and she only talks in Marvel movie one-liners. I work alone, for it is better to be alone than to lose another loved one. Uh oh, he's behind me, isn't he? Um, so that just happened. But a neat thing that Baldur's Gate 3 does is not do this. Yes, new NPCs are introduced as the story moves forward, but people that you meet in Act 1 that you 100% do not believe you will ever meet again do come back. And suddenly the rando with whom you had three lines of dialogue with becomes less of a rando and like an actual character that sticks in your mind. I'll give the example of the tieflings. In Act 1, like 10 minutes after starting the game, once again, people that cry at spoilers, it's fine, I'm not spoiling anything. You meet with some tieflings that are in a bit of a pickle. You go through 
to Act 1, you make your choices. If you're not a monster, you make the right choices, and you move on to dodging every single party member that wants to jump your bones. And then, you see those tieflings again. You meet the tieflings again later on in the game a bunch of times, and suddenly it's not, oh yeah, that guy with the goofy banging animation. That's your boy Damon, and an emotional connection starts to develop. Yes, the game could have replaced those tieflings from Act 1 with, I don't know, some brand new NPC group, the old lady faction or whatever, but reusing the tieflings made all of them feel like real characters, but it also made the world feel alive and lived in with people whose stories continue parallel to yours. I've done this in campaigns with important NPCs, of course, and I bet you have too, but I'm telling you, try to do this with non-important NPCs. The party talked with a random guy and you decided to give him a stutter and a passion for short shorts for flavor? Neat! Bring back that guy next time you need some goblin captives that the party needs to free. You will see how your player's eyes light up the moment they realize that the shorts guy is back. I guarantee it. And since we're on the topic of DMing, integrate backstory into the main story. I generally divide backstory integration in D&D into three schools. The first one I like to call the School of Bad, where the backstory is just not integrated in any shape or form into the campaign, or barely integrated at all. Like you maybe meet your mom one time and she's there and that's it. I'll be charitable and say that I absolutely hate this one, and I will venture a guess and say that most players also don't love it. Can't wait to hear the comments about how you love being ignored because it's your kink or something. Anyway, this one doesn't even deserve to be talked about more than we already have. Moving on. The second school is the school of a very special episode, or the Arc School. I love this one. In these campaigns, you have a main plot, and then you divert from that main plot when the party stumbles into someone's backstory-relevant location slash NPC slash item. Then it's time for either a very special episode or a whole arc where that character is a bit more of a protagonist as the story centers around them a little bit more. It's very anime. Once that is done, it's back to the main plot until the party stumbles into the next piece of backstory from someone else. I thought Baldur's Gate was going to be this way, Dragon Age certainly does exactly this, and I like Dragon Age a, a normal amount. But no! Baldur's Gate 3 is a member of the secret third school of backstory integration. The third one, the school of tying it back to the main plot. In this school, all character backstories end up connected, some more heavily than others, to the main plot of the campaign. Now, I'm gonna be honest about this, this is plainly the hardest one to do. It requires more planning and also some impressive creative muscle flexing to make it so that each character's backstory does have a place to connect to to the main plot, without it feeling forced, or without rewriting the backstory completely. Don't, don't do that. Just PSA here. Don't do that. We'll talk about it in another video, but don't do that. A good way to set you up for success if you're attempting this is... Well, first, maybe don't try this if it's your first go at a long-term campaign, but if you must, be involved with your players when they're crafting their backstory. And if you're a player and you want this, a cheat code to get exactly this is, listen up, go to your DM and say these magic words. I want my backstory to come up during the main plot of our campaign. What plot threads could I use to create a backstory that you can then use to tie it back to the main plot? I know, communication, pretty advanced magic stuff going on here, but I believe in you. You can do it. Moving on to number four, bypass encounters on purpose. So if you've DM'd any substantial amount, you've encountered this. You come up with a really cool encounter, you do a bunch of prep, you're very excited to run it, and then the bard, and nine times out of 10, it's the bard because they get all the utility spells, just completely bypasses it. Or the players make a convincing enough argument and the fight is canceled, if you're a good DM, and you sit there chomp-like as you see all that work go to waste. Now, what if I told you that you could do that on purpose? Baldur's Gate 3 does this a bunch. Maybe I noticed this more because I immediately beelined for the highest charisma build I could possibly get and also went with Bard and like 90% of my spells were useful out of combat and crowd control. But it's insane to me the amount of times you can talk your way out of an encounter or trap someone so that the encounter is laughable or tell someone to kiss but with a Y and only one S. Now, I was always a strong proponent of being fair with your players and letting them bypass these encounters if they found a way to do so. But now I think that if you can bake in a way to bypass them and telegraph it to your players, that can lead to more of those moments of them feeling awesome about it, rather than leaving that up to chance. Imagine an encounter where you are fighting on top of a frozen lake. The session beforehand, you had conveniently told the players that decided to read up on the local fauna that there is an Aboleth variant that lives in those lakes that gets extremely hungry during the winter because they can't break the ice 
player. Now that that little idea has been implanted into the minds of your players, I don't know a single red-blooded adventurer who wouldn't try to break the ice under the enemy's feet to drop them right into the abolith waiting below in the cold waters. Want it even simpler? Cool. If they're fighting a guy, make it so that guy can't be talked out of it. I have been at so many tables where it didn't matter how many good points I raised or even what spells I cast to avoid a combat encounter, I could tell that the DM was just never allowing me to not get out of this without a fight, even when it made sense for me to be able to. If you're DMing, just don't do this. The twinkle in the player's eyes when they think they have outsmarted you is worth it. They're so cute, thinking they pulled one over me. Puny mortals. But pointy. I hear you say very loudly thanks to my extremely developed psionic capabilities. What about all that prep I did? I don't want to throw that away. Okay, I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. You don't. Reskin that sucker! Were they fighting a Manacore? Well, guess what? They're fighting a Hippogriff next, and this one has poison talons. Were they fighting a magical mob boss and his henchmen? Well, I guess in a couple of sessions, they'll be fighting the magical city captains and their guards. I know it seems like you lost all that prep in the moment, but if you just breathe and give it a second, you will see how easy it is to reskin whatever you lost for later on. Even if they go up in levels, slap some more HP, give it an extra attack, increase the damage die from D6 to D8. It's easy, and the payoff from your players is 100% worth it. And that concludes our section on narrative. I could talk about the three-act structure and how Baldur's Gate 3 uses it, but also doesn't, not even a little bit, and how that can be applied to D&D campaigns, but that's way too long and meaty enough for a whole video, so let's move on to mechanics. The section that everyone that is into the nitpicky, um, actually rules lawyering, power gaming, theory crafting stuff loves. Oh, who am I kidding? I love it too. Let's go. I'll start with my biggest change and then move on to smaller ones. One, shorten your short rests. D&D was designed for you to be short resting way more often than you're probably short resting, but not across the board for all classes, which great. It's a great choice, guys. You can really, really feel this if you have a warlock or a monk in your party. And depending on the subclass of the bard, they are prone to cry about this too. Some classes are extremely dependent on short rest, whereas some classes like the barbarian or the rogue mostly just need them for HP, especially the rogue. Short rests are also a full hour long of sitting around counting ceiling tiles. It takes a long time to short rest, which does not really work if your players are, I don't know, doing anything pressing at all. Like, you know, adventurers often are. Are they chasing after a baddie that has taken cover in a dungeon? It now feels weird to ask for one hour of catching your breath after the very first fight, like you're the asthmatic kid in PE. Friendly NPC got kidnapped and you gotta get them back before the bad guy does a bit of a sacrifice to bring the god with the stupid name into the prime material plane or whatever, it really does not feel like it's the right time to tell your buddies that you need one hour to count five things you can see, four things you can touch, and three things you can stab right now. Short rests by design should be taken often, but narratively feel like they grind the game to a halt and break immersion. So what are poor gamers to do? Well, just make him shorter. In Baldur's Gate 3, you simply press the short rest button and bam, your little guys are all freshened up as if they just stepped out of a shaving razor commercial. They found us! The safe house is compromised! Run! Run for your lives! I've tried running short rest as half an hour in a year-long campaign, and it did alleviate this problem basically completely. But I haven't playtested more than that. I would say try it out. Hell, if you're adventurous, run them as 15 minutes. Or hell, run them as instantaneous. Make some plot reason for it. And before you cry in the comments, remember that hit dice are already capped. They can short rest constantly forever. And I don't want to hear any coffee lock BS. You take that power gaming out of my comment section, you'll make it dirty. If you're scared that warlocks will get too many spells, or you're scared that monks will be too overpowered. <laughs> oh, that was funny. You can make it so that spell slots and key points and other short rest dependent resources won't be replenished if you don't roll hit dice. Presto, easy. Try it before you knock it. All right, that was a big one. Let's do some quick ones. Two, do away with any before you know the result mess. You know those cursed abilities that go, you can use this after you roll, but before you know the result. Does anyone actually play like that? My main instinct as a DM is to see the result immediately after someone tells me their roll. So I'm not gonna tell you to ignore that, no, no. I'm gonna tell you to ignore that and to make more things in the game that you are able to cast after you know if it fails or not. XP to level three talked about this and now I have to add this line in the script. I started writing after Gen Con because I know one of you will sit there and tell me that I copied him. I didn't, but spells like Guidance in Baldur's Gate Three are things you can add to your roll when you're about to roll. Ditto for friends, ditto for the barbarian's reckless attack. Reckless attack specifically. If your barbarian attacks and the roll is too low to hit, the game will literally pause and go, hey, 
You need 15 to hit and you roll the three. Want to use reckless attack and roll again? And I think that's neat. Allowing people to cast guidance on a skill check after they know their roll has failed, if they can, which the game doesn't do, but I think it would work much better at the table, will do away with the cleric having to scream, I cast guidance every single time a check is happening. Or worse, the cleric feeling bad if they forgot to scream, I cast guidance, and someone misses their check by like two. Try it, see if you like it. Number three, long rest buffs. In the game, there are so many utility spells that you can cast that just last until the next long rest. Yep, just until you long rest, you have them. These are super specific, but they tend to be spells that can be cast as ritual. And I love this so much. <laughs> Will it really break your game if someone has speak with animals up until they long rest? Water walk, water breathing, ha! <laughs> Trick question. That one lasts 24 hours. It already does this. As I said, most of these are ritual spells, and I can definitely see some ritual spells that should not give you such a long buff, like identify or detect poison and disease. But there are so many that I just think would be plainly more fun if they lasted longer, and doing so offers little to no penalty or balance tweaking. And if speaking with a beast in combat allows the players to convince it not to fight, please go back to my previous point about bypassing encounters. It's fine. Do it. Number four, shoot your monks and your druids and your bards and everybody else. So for those of you who don't know, shoot your monks is a common D&D piece of advice where you're told to actually cater to the abilities of your characters because monks can deflect missiles. So you should be shooting missiles to your monks, except not magic missiles because they can't deflect those. No, monks. Anyway, this is, for once, a common D&D advice that I completely and utterly agree with. If you spend your time trying to thwart your players and put them in niche situations where their characters are going to be absolute chumps at, you're, whatever, I'll say it, you're a bad DM! <laughs> You are bad at this. Stop being bad at this. I don't want to play with you. Nobody does. That's not difficulty. That's not challenge. That's you using the power of omniscience that DMing grants you to be. I think the technical term here is a dick. For those out there who have a hard time understanding basic concepts, I am not saying make it easy for your players. My players can tell you I run a very challenging game, but challenging in a real way. Not in a, this monster is suddenly resistant to every type of damage you guys specifically inflict. If your cleric can turn undead, put a whole bunch of undead for them to turn. Baldur's Gate 3 does this all the time. And you wanna know why? Because it feels awesome. And that's a feeling that most good DMs want to elicit in their players. Your druid can turn into an animal, put a whole bunch of places where only a rat can crawl through. Your players need to distract the guards long enough to get into the speak easy unseen. It appears that there's a street stage ready for your bard player to perform a distraction. Do this, it will make your players feel amazing. And finally, number five, magic item bonus square. I'm just gonna shout out Baldur's Gate 3 for the insanely cool magic item resource it is. You can very much use your inventory as a whole ass catalog for possible goodies to add to your character in character creation or to give to your players at the end of a dungeon if you're a DM. Consumables play such a massive role in this game and are probably the thing I'm gonna be changing the most in my home games after playing Baldur's Gate 3. Spell scrolls were basically only in my campaigns if I had a wizard player and those were there for them to copy into their spell book. I guess I'm not that bright because it never occurred to me how cool it is for anyone to be able to cast a spell at any any time as long as they have a scroll for it. Ditto for potions, especially with the ability to throw them around to help allies or hinder enemies, or even code your weapons with it. And since Baldur's Gate 3 uses a system that is so close to D&D, most of these you don't even have to do much converting at all to bring it to your table. This works with equipment by the way, there are so many cool equipment pieces. And my favorite, class specific equipment, a bunch of weapons and armors that are tailor made for specific classes to get the most out of. Oh and also because there's a non-zero chance they made an item in the game? A reference to me? See the name of the eye and everything. It, it might be, but well, I'm not sure. There's this cool sword, don't worry, still in Act 1, called the Falar Alouv. That's my guess. I bet that means something in Elvis that someone in the comments will call me an idiot for not knowing. Can't wait for that. Anyway, it's specifically a sword that feels like it was made with bards in mind. You can either make it sing, which means everyone around you gets a d4 to their attack rolls and saving throws, or shriek, which means that it debuffs nearby enemies. It's so sick. Like, come on. There's so much of that. The game is filled with items like that. So, yeah. That's all the stuff, both narrative and mechanic-wise, that I thought would be interesting to incorporate into your game of D&D. Normally, when I do these videos, I always give you something for free at the end of them. A subclass, a race, a monster. It's a shame that this one doesn't have any. I guess the tips I've given in this video should be enough of a gift. So you can go now. You can go play your game. Psych! You thought. I told myself that if there's something that is super easy to incorporate from this video is the advice to just steal items from Baldur's Gate 3. And since not all of you play the game, I thought I would put my money where my mouth is and do that. That's right. My version of the fal... 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 Fal...
whatever. The Banshee Blade, the sword inspired by the Falar Aluv, is in the description of this very video for 100% free. And guess what? I made it evolve like a sharp, stabby Pokemon. The Banshee Blade can become a more powerful version of itself, so you don't have to throw it out the moment you find a plus two sword. It has the baseline abilities found in Baldur's Gate 3, but a bunch more as it becomes stronger. And I think that's neat. So dust the cake Cheeto dust off of your fingers. Unstick yourself from the pleather of your ergonomic gamer chair. Open the goddamn windows to let some air in and play some D&D with non-polygonal friends. And it's the end of the video. It's the end and the start of my stream soon. I don't know exactly when you're watching this, so it could be an hour or two or less. Time is a soup. You can go to my Twitch channel in the description to check it out. It would truly, truly mean a lot to me if you came to hang out. As I said, we're gonna be building an entire world together and I'm so excited about that. I'm not a massive Twitch slash stream watcher in general. So when I was coming up with what I wanted to do on stream, I really, really wanted to make something I would watch and I didn't wanna make it an actual play. I think the idea of all of us building something together live is so sick and I think it can be informative and help you do it on your own too. And I think it will be funny because my mom thinks I'm funny, so yeah. And if all that world building talk is boring, it's fine. You can come hang out next week on Wednesday when I stream Baldur's Gate 3 with the dark urge thing. Let's make Shadow the Hedgehog together. And I think that's exciting. Anyway, enough. Thank you so much for watching, for sharing, for everything. We are well on our way to the halfway point to 500k. <laughs> that's just... It's just, I guess it's just as wild as always. It's, I always say it's so wild, and it, it still it is wild, but it's still just as wild. Remember to stretch your wrists before and after doing a lot of repetitive motions with your hands. Take care of your body so you can be a better gamer. God's favorite gamer. Okay, lo lost the plot of the outro. Okay, enough. Bye. Bye-bye. See you on stream. Hopefully. Bye-bye.